have a very exciting yet challenging word for you. I believe that God has placed this upon my spirit for today. In fact, I was initially scheduled in my heart to preach this on October 17th, and I was not released. Many things happened. We were out of town on vacation. And well, today is the day to release what I believe is probably one of the most impacting words the Lord has shown me. And I want you to lay hold of it today. How many had a shower this morning? How many had a drink of water today? You know, what your pastor is, is I'm not the water source, that's God. That would be your well, that would be your city water that comes. And I'm not necessarily even the water that you partake of, you drink of, and you take, you know, a bath with your rubber ducky. But I am the pipe. And the thing about pipes is, as long as everything's working good, they pretty much remain unnoticed. They're hidden. The only time you ever think about the pipes is if you turn the water on and something's broke and you got to mess with that. Other than that, you don't even think about the pipes. You got to drink this morning and not one time did you praise God for the pipes that that water ran through. You took a shower this morning and as you were scrubbing and singing and praising the Lord, getting ready for a great day, not one time did you say, Lord, thank you for the pipes. This water just flew out. So today, just remember, as I preach this challenging word, one, I do so with a heart of love for all of you, and I'm so proud to be your pastor. Early this morning when I got up, put my feet on the floor, right after I said, thank you, Jesus, good morning, Lord, I said, I pastor the greatest church in the world. That's honestly, when I put my feet in my slip slips, otherwise known as rowboats, I mean, so, so I said, Lord, thank you, and I love you all so much. What a great... Thanksgiving crowd we have this we're growing we're going back we're getting back our comeback is in full swing we're getting there amen we're getting there and we appreciate your faithfulness so today just I'm just the pipe don't you know don't take any issue with the pipe you know but the fact the fact is the little pipe you get a little drip but if you get a big pipe somebody's gonna get wet so you got a big pipe God's working with today, but I want to challenge you. You know, one of the most famous uh, visions of Ezekiel is found in chapter 37, the vision of dry bones. A lot of times, 10 chapters over contains a, a, a vision I want to talk about today. It's not as famous as that vision, but it's very, very important that we see this. So just before you're seated, I want to put you in Ezekiel. And listen, you need to take notes today. You need to take some pictures of the points I put on the screen. You need to get engaged in this because this is not just a one-time church sermon product. This word is determined uh, and it's given and it's destined to change how you live your life. So Ezekiel chapter 47, he sees this temple door and the water was there. It's the subject matter is water flowing from the threshold of the temple toward the east and the front to the temple face the east. The water was flowing under the right side of the temple, the south of the altar. And there was a man, this man brought me out of the north gate and led me around the outside of the outer gate that faces the east and there was water. So now you got to see Ezekiel's getting this vision and it is a prophecy, but it's also very applicable to what we are living in today. He's seeing this vision and this man enters the scene and he has some form of measuring unit, some way to measure out. He begins to measure. And the man, verse 3, brings me um, to the east and has a line in his hand. He measured 1,000 cubits and brought me through the waters. Everybody catch this. And the waters first came up to my ankles. He measured another 1,000 and brought me to the waters that came up to my knees. And then I went out a little farther and it came up to my waist. Verse 5 says, and again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross. Notice the progression. Started out at my ankles, to my knees, to my waist, and now there was this river, and the water was too deep. Water in which one must swim. 
It was a river that could not be crossed. Okay, on the comeback theme, it's time to come back. Are you ready? To the deep. Come back to the deep. Amen? Thank you for standing so long and worshiping so great. I appreciate you. Would you lift your hands one more time? And just, come on, just tell out, tell out to the Lord. Speak out to him, Lord. Put this word in my heart. I will apply this word to me. It's not for anybody else but for me. I'm not sitting here thinking that I don't need this word, God. It is for me. Come on, would you honestly, sincerely do that? It is for me. It is for me. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. You may be seated. You know, I want to thank you for being here today. And I want to go on record that the Bible you and I read every day. In the New Testament that we believe is absolutely true and cannot be contradicted in the new testament it's interesting enough that it's really more than how a person gets saved in fact someone said that the new testament is about one-third how you get saved about the cost that jesus paid on the cross for us so if you divide your new testament about one-third of it when you read it will tell you how to get saved how to have your sins forgiven how to get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, how to go to heaven when you pass, that's about one-third. But the truth is, when you got saved, in most cases, you have life to live after your born-again experience. You don't get saved, and I wish that some people could because they're almost like they have to backslide several times. Some people just need to get saved, and the Lord needs to take them right then. But for you and me, we got saved and we got life in front of us. We got a certain way to live. Now, here's where a lot of people get tripped up. They only want to hear about one-third of what the New Testament says. They want to hear about how they get saved. And listen, there's no replacing the grace message. There's no replacing the mercy that he gave to us. There's no substitute, and that's why we sing and rejoice, because Jesus paid it all. It's undeserved. It's unmerited. It is free. It is gratis. It is what God did for us. God came after us before we went after him. God chose us long before we ever chose him. Christianity is different than that. Every other religion, people are seeking God. Man, search for God. But Christianity is about God searching for man, seeking after man. He left the 99 and went out for us. We were the one. Come on, somebody. But where we fail, God's people like you oftentimes is that we leave out a majority of what your new testament is about so what would the other two-thirds be about well one-third is how you get saved now everybody are you with me today the remaining two-thirds is how you live after you're saved there's a certain conduct there's a certain rule there's some ethics there are some things that god commands of his people if we are to be his children and if we are to be named as christians then we got to understand there is a certain way there is a certain um procedure there is a system that you and i must live in we must follow the word now i praise god that we're saved i thank god and we could just be all day just thanking god and years thanking god in fact we'll spend eternity thanking him that's what we'll do we'll thank him We'll lay our crown at his feet and we will just rejoice in the gift of our salvation. Hallelujah. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When we get to heaven, we will know he purchased heaven for us. It was nothing we earned, deserve. Yet while we are here, we are living in this world right now. If we are saved, is anybody saved in this church? While we are here, while we've been born again, how do I now live? How do I now make my decisions? What will my behavior be based on? What will be my standard? What will be my worldview? What will be how I perceive others and I perceive God's plan for me? All of these questions remain up to us. 
But the reality is there is no ambiguity. God says, if you are to be my disciple, you must do this. If you are to be a follower of me, all my followers do this. Today's word is about not getting you saved. Because I believe most of you are saved. Isn't it interesting, if you look back at the pictures that Kathy and I uh, came uh, 33 and a half years ago, I had this head full of hair. If you want to keep your hair, don't pastor because they'll drive you nuts. I said, I believe most of you are saved. And the reality is, how do we live? And today's word is going to help you with that. This is a challenging word, and I want you to receive it. Are you ready for this? You know, it's been said of a lot of believers, a lot of Christians, that they may be a mile wide, but they're only an inch deep. Mm -hmm. I mean, they look like good Christians. They may talk like good believers. And they may have by all accounts and appearances it all together, and they just are serving God with just great success. And yet it has been a long time that they've experienced growth in their walk with the Lord. And we've been talking about this over this pandemic season, and it's this. Some people say, I've been, I've been saved for 40 years, or I've been saved for 20 years. And reality is, they may have been saved for 25 years, but they are just redoing their first year of salvation 24 more times. And God is not satisfied with that. That's not good enough for God. What he asks of his people is that we experience a deep walk with him. And today, maybe for a while, or maybe it's been a long time, or maybe you've never experienced it today, I'm going to challenge you and I'm going to urge you with all grace and love to look at your walk with the Lord and to ask yourself this question in the comeback year. Could I go a little deeper? And God expects his people to go deeper. It's kind of like Jesus' parable when he talked about the sower that sowed seed. In Mark chapter 4, we read that it happened as he sowed seed. Some fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have depth of earth, and immediately sprang up because there was no depth Everybody who's ever planted a garden knows you got to till the soil. You got to get that hard and, and rough part. You got to deal with the rocks. You got to deal with the hardness of ground. And then you got to till it. You got to cultivate it. You got to go deep. You got to plant that seed deep, or it will not survive the heat and the pressure. And so, what God is saying to us today, what He's using this very large pipe to say, is that it's time. It's time for some of you to put a question to that person in the mirror. When was the last time I really grew? When was the last time I experienced a deeper walk? The seed was not put in prepared deep soil. He continues this parable, Luke chapter 8. And now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, but then the devil comes and takes the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those when they hear the word, receive word with the word with joy, and yet there's no root who believe for a while, and in time of temptation they fall away. Did you hear me? They believe for a while. They receive it with joy. Oh, I'm so glad that I've heard the gospel. I'm so glad that Jesus has forgiven me. But because there's no depth, because there's no root, because they don't lay hold of the word and say, I'm not only going to be saved, I'm going to conduct my life in the manner that is pleasing to God, then when temptation comes, they just fall away. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who when they've heard, they go out and are choked with the cares, the riches, the pleasures of life. 
and bring no fruit to maturity. Now listen to me, everybody. Here's a sad rally. There are many believers who never go any deeper than they did the day they received Christ. And they live life without depth, and they make their home in the shallow end. If you're still glad you're here, and if there's any chance you still love your pastor, say amen. amen. The reality is when we do not take an intentional approach to our walk with the Lord, and we don't make an effort, it doesn't happen accidentally. When we say, God, I'm going to dig deep into your word. I'm going to memorize your word. I'm going to apply your word to my heart. I'm going to hide it in my heart that I may not sin against God. When we allow our walk with God to be relegated to a Sunday morning church service of an hour and a half or so, and we call that serving the Lord, there's more to it. This church is not about what only happens on Sunday morning. It's really more about how you live Monday through Saturday. We're here to aid you and to encourage you and to inspire you. But if you go deep, I cannot go deep for you. That is up to you. What has been revealed in our current circumstances is really and truly a lack of depth. depth. I want to make this statement. It's interesting that it took a little bitty, eensy, beensy, teeny weeny thing called a pandemic. And incidentally, God didn't send it because God is in the healing business, not the sick business. Jesus Christ died on the cross to heal our, heal our sick body. So sickness is not from heaven. That is the work of the enemy. But does God allow things to happen as tests? The answer to that question can only be yes. And when we pass the test, the test finally gets over. We turn our paper in, we put our pencils down, and we took the test, and we passed it. And maybe this thing is lingering because a lot of believers ain't passed the test yet. I don't know. This is just my humble thought. I'm just telling you that the minute we start blaming God and the minute we start thinking, okay, um, uh, I, I can't serve God in all this, that reveals our lack of depth. I found out, I found out in the past almost two years that there are some people who are deep in God and uh, uh, what they went through and what we are walking through in our world did not shake them. In fact, it caused them to get deeper. There are many people here today that you are deeper in God than you have ever been. There are many people here today you are bearing fruit, you are producing fruit, your life is growing. And then there are some people that, that when the situation was hurt, hurting them and when they did not know what to do, they, they, they seemed as though they turned their back on God. And in the pandemic, the hot have got hotter and the cold have got colder. And the lukewarm, like always, are stuck in the middle, miserable as ever. And so I say to you with all love, I say to you with all concern, we either can let the attack and the difficulty and the pain and the horrible ordeal we've been through drive us deeper or drive us away. But the choice is not God's, and the choice is not the devil. The choice is ours. We cannot spend our life, everybody, in the waiting pool. I want to put a statement. There's a reason they call it the kiddie pool. For, because it's for kiddies. If you were an awesome grandpa like me, in fact, I don't even think this is on anymore. Is Dora the Explorer still on? Sure. Because I love my grandkids, but when they turn this stuff on, Papa gets his Bible, and I just tune out. I'm not interested in Dora. I'm not interested in the Octobots, Octonauts. I'm not interested in Chase is on the case. Um, what's the real horrible one that they're um, helping? Bubble guppies, oh my Lord. I'm pretty sure they're showing bubble guppies right now in hell. I'm pretty sure. It is dreadful. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what, the fire's not enough? The worm's not enough? I got to watch this? 
But a reason I even have it on because all my grandkids like it. So, you know, I, t I take one for the team. The things you do for love. But we, but we live our life as a believer, and for many of us, we never get out of the cute little pink Dora, Dora Explorer kiddie pool. And today is the day that we have a comeback to the deep. That for once, we can say, I've heard the word. I've let the word uh, influence how I live my life, and I'm going to do some changing. Paul writes this phenomenal truth in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, and verse 11. He said, when I was a child, when I was a child, when I was a kid, I played in the kiddie pool. When I was a kid, I enjoyed kid things. When I was a kid, I watched Dora the Explorer and Octonauts and Bubble Guppies. But now that I have grown, some things have changed. When I, I was a child, I thought as a child, I talked as a child, I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Ephesians 4 and 13, till we all come to unity and the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God made perfect in the statue and the measure of the fullness of Christ, we should no longer, listen to me, church, be children tossed to and fro with the winds and the doctrines of cunning devices and the trickery of men. Listen, church, we cannot fall into the latest fad, the latest attack upon the Word of God. Somebody does a podcast, and so quickly we are brought into this place where the things we have built our lives on no longer count. But I will tell you, the Word of God stands tested, tried, and true. If you build your life on the foundation, the winds will come and the rain will descend and the storms will howl, but your, your house is on the rock and it will remain steadfast. If you build your house on the shifting sand of men, man's attitudes and culture, the rain will come and howl and blow and your house will fall because it was not built on the rock Christ Jesus. I got anybody glad you're founded upon the rock to take a praise break with me and just get excited about you know how the storm is not going to knock you down. You're deeper than that. You're better than that. You're stronger than that. Paul right in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, Brethren, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now, you are still not able. For you are still carnal. For where there is envy and strife, there are divisions among you. Are you not carnal and believing like the rest of the world? Listen, church, there's a different way we conduct our lives. I got a real uh, wake-up call when Timothy McCain was here a couple weeks ago and he preached on Saturday night about our culture and he was kind of nervous. He told me a couple times, you know, I preached this message at a lot of churches and they didn't receive it. And they got upset and they got mad and, you know, they brought attack. And I, and I said to him, let me tell you something. Lighthouse is used to strong preaching. Listen, we've gotten, we've gotten past Gerber baby food a long time ago. Today I'm giving you some meat. We ain't got time for that little spoon with the rubber on it, so don't hurt your gums. Go and chew, chew, chew. We got to open up. We got to get the A1 sauce and the Heinz 57 sauce out because we're going to get some ribeye, we're going to get some T-bone, and we're going to give you a steak, and we're going to chomp, chomp, chomp. And when we go, when we leave, we're going to feel like Thanksgiving all over again. We're going to be fattened on our bones. We're going to have something to sustain us. Today, I come by to tell you it's time to get out of the kiddie pool. Amen. If you've ever taken a picture, get your phone out. I'm going to put one statement, one line. I want you to write it down or take a picture of this. God's expectation for us is that we grow. That we grow that we stop struggling with the same things we've always struggled with. Come on. 
You've run into people that you haven't seen in the church for 20 years, and 20 years later at Walmart, they got a few more wrinkles, but they're still nasty as they was 20 years ago. Boy, if they, those folks at Walmart. Am I telling you what the truth is? I mean, they were griping and complaining about something 40 years ago, and they're still griping and complaining about something today. Nothing's ever good enough. Nothing ever fits their, uh, uh, their reasoning. And the problem is we've tolerated our sin and our compromise long enough. And it's time we grow. Here's what I'm worried about. Here's what I concern myself with. Today's flavor of sins in the church don't hurt us enough. I mean, we are so quick to get upset with people in their kind of lives, yet we tolerate ourselves, our robbing God, our lack of generosity, our gossiping, our compromise, our little white lies, our horrible marriage that we just decide we don't want to work on. Come on. <laughs> and so what we do is, is we just, you know, we just carry our, our kiddie pool wherever we go. Have kiddie pool, we'll travel. I don't like what you said, Pastor. I'm going to take my kiddie pool to another church. I don't appreciate them. I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like them. I, I just don't think it's right. And so, you know, I'm just taking my, I'm taking my kiddie pool. My wife said this, so I'm taking my kiddie pool to our marriage. My kid said this, so I'm carrying my kiddie pool everywhere I go. This is my best friend because I am not, don't ask me to get any deeper than my little ankles. I'm very comfortable with my kiddie pool. In my kiddie pool, I get used to the temperature. In my kiddie pool, I can still watch TV. I can eat. I can just enjoy life. I'm not challenged. I don't have to get all wet. My hair doesn't get messed up. I don't get my clothes messed up. I just love the kiddie pool. My uh, good boy up there, my, my son in the Lord, one of my many sons, Robbie, was talking to me a couple years ago. Robbie, I don't know if you remember this. But he ran into me, and I had my hand all wrapped. And it was wrapped, it wrapped and wrapped, and blood was still coming through. And he said, Pastor, what in the world? And I said, well, can't fix stupid. He said, oh, dear Lord, what did you do now? And I said, well, it happened to be I went home on Wednesday before church. You know how I love my projects. I get my projects in my mind. If it makes it to my to-do list, it haunts me until I scratch it off. And it was on my to-do list, and I was going to power wash something. So I started up my power washer. Can I just say it like this, washer? I was washing something. And it kind of moved on me. And so while I had the trigger in this power washer, I thought I'd take my hand and get in front of it and, and help. Well, guess what? All of a sudden, this horrific pain hit me. My skin bust open. Blood starts flying out. And the first thing I did was let go of the trigger. Listen, I didn't have to call the prayer hotline. <laughs> I didn't have to get agreement on it. I didn't have to call a committee meeting. I didn't have to think about it, process it, contemplate it. Bubba let go of the trigger. My skin's open. I can see all kinds of meat in there. And it, but I know this is gross. You're getting ready for lunch. But uh, it's just it just was rough. Robbie made... An incredible statement that I have never forgot. He probably forgot, but I'll, I'll remind him. And he said, I bet you don't do that again. What if sin was that way? I lied. Ow! It was like a shot collar on your mutt. <coughs> what if God brought down the Holy Ghost taser? <laughs> but that's not how God operates. God wants us to see our sin 
under the conviction of the lens of the Holy Spirit microscope. And on our own volition, we need to decide that's not only hurting me, because when you sin, you don't take yourself down alone. Somebody is affected by your sin. When Achan stole from God and robbed what was God, his whole family was burnt to crit. It only hurts you and it hurts your family, but it hurts him. When you sin and you know better, you crucify Jesus all over again. And church, I'm telling you, that's so long and for too long we have gotten accustomed to our compromising lives. We think that it's somebody else's job to provide for the church. Somebody else will meet the need. Somebody else will get the job done. Somebody else will be a blessing. And when I'll come, I'll come and I'll just partake. But it's time that people, when you grow, you start taking it personally. You take responsibility. You get out of being a spectator. You get out of the stands and the bleachers, and you get a, to be a part of the team. And you take ownership in the kingdom of God. That's what being growing is all about. That's what maturing is all about. We don't keep struggling with the same things we've always struggled with. For once and for all, we gain victory over our sin. It's time that we become so discontent with what this prophecy called the shallow end. I want you to take a few notes, take one more moment and note this. In this prophecy, Ezekiel is brought out to the temple, and he begins to see this water, and a man begins to measure and a thousand cubits or whatever it is. Uh, in today's vernacular, it's probably 1,750 feet. It's a long way. And as he walked with this man and began to measure, he identified, I want everybody to catch this, the varying depths that people live their life in. It is representative, this is a parable to what life can look like. Number one, he said, the first thing I noticed was that it was ankle deep. Come over here, Dora. I'm going to preach on top of this kiddie pool for just a moment. You know, when you're hot and you're out in the hot sun, you're on the beach, uh, you know, there's something kind of a little refreshing. It feels good. It just feels nice to go in and, and just wiggle your toes in the water. Yet, here's what I want to tell you about people that just get ankle deep. They never want to change. Uh, they think they're fine on the shore next to where they can run quickly. If the water starts rising, they're in a safe zone. And they can escape quickly because they are just ankle deep. They get temporary relief, but it doesn't fix eternal problems. Are you hearing me? They feel better for a moment, but it doesn't solve the eternity issue. It doesn't uh, fix and solve our witness issue. Listen to me. God was never meant to be an aspirin. Something you pop in and feel better for a moment. And all these pill bottles say for temporary relief. That's not what our life is to look like. We don't just get ankle deep just to feel better and cool off for a while. Uh, it's like I come to church and I think, well, you know, there's nice people at church, yet I don't build relationships. I don't uh, engage with them. I don't talk to them. I don't pray with them. I don't bear their burdens. And, you know, we're kind of like, okay, church is fine. That's ankle deep. Then he says, now he took me to the knees. And the knees are a little deeper. That's when you got to roll your pants up. Come on. I would illustrate this, but I don't want to lead you in temptation. Lusteth now thou after thy pastor. Only one can do that in this room.
Here's the reality. We've got to go a little deeper. That's when, well, you might actually participate. You might sing some songs in worship, and you might, um, you know, have, have a good time, and it might just be a, 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 a wonderful experience for you. But here is what people need deep to. Just as the people ankle deep don't want to change, the people that are knee deep are still not willing to go all the way with Jesus. They're holding something back. Note this. You're still too close to the shore. You come to church, you're in the water a little bit, having a good time, but tomorrow you're back in the world. Listen, if it's right on Sunday, it should be right every day. I'm not going to yell and scream my wife on Sunday. So Monday's okay? I'm not going to do any cussing on Sunday. You shouldn't cuss on, on Sunday. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, what you decided on Friday, it's okay. I'm not going to drink anything I should be drinking on Sunday. I'm not going to act that way because it's church day. I got my, I, I got my pants rolled up, and I'm knee deep. That's where I'm at. But tomorrow it's okay. Oh, this is preaching. The prophecy continues, then you go waist deep. Now, here's the thing about waist deep. It's when it really starts being comfortable. <laughs> I wrote this down. The water starts hitting some sensitive areas. I mean, you've been in that cold, you've been in that cold beach, your ankles and your knees, and all of a sudden, whoa. Looking at the shore, you're looking to the deep, and you're stuck in the middle. God never can use anybody who's stuck in the middle. We gotta make up our minds. We just got we gotta get better better than halfway with God. With God, there is no middle ground. We have got to understand that we go deeper. When that water hits our waist, it hits our reproductive ability. And you know why some people never lead anybody to the Lord? It's because they just stay waist deep, and they're not quite sure if they want to produce fruit. Well, this is preaching to somebody. It is time today. I want, to, I want to challenge you. Why is it okay for us to have this thought in the church? And we have it. You know, that person has been an alcoholic. If they really got saved, well, they may have been an alcoholic 20, 40 years. They need to quit. Boom. We expect them to change their behavior. That drug addict. They have put, put in that junk in their blood year after year after year. But when they come to the Lord, we're not going to give them any grace if they have a fallback. They have a relapse. So, What's wrong with them? But we bring our lack of depth into our walk with God, and we think, I've always been at my ankles. I'm going to stay at my ankles. It's not a problem. I've always been at my knees. I'm going to stay at my knees. It's no big deal. I'm going to stay at my waist. That's just, that's just where I live. I live there. But the reality is our compromise and our desire and our lack of desire to get all the way in with God and to go deeper with God is just as wrong and is just as much of a sin as those folks. You know, we preach it all the time, and people uh, in our world and in the church, can, we can really be strong on certain sins. Come on. And you don't have to be attracted to the same gender of you to still sin in the bed. People run in and out. They're not married. They never got married. They've never been married. They don't want to get married. They don't need to get married. I'm telling you as your pastor, it's time. You either change your behavior or show somebody to the door. And it may be heterosexual, that would make it right. Come on. And we got folks that just, 
Tithing is for somebody else. They have never have. They never will. They're not interested. They just write themselves a pass, and you're still not going deeper. When you go deep, you will know it. Something will change. Revelation 3 and 16 says, because you're not hot or because you're not cold, because you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. And church, I'm just telling you, Lighthouse is not sitting on this hill to produce people who just get up to their waist. Our goal, our plan, our God-given dream, our destiny, our commission is to produce believers that go deep with God. It is seen in their conduct. It is seen in their talk. It is seen in how they live. It is seen in how they care, how they give, how they witness, how they respond, how they own their call, how they pursue God, how they're hungry for more of God. It is time that some of you get hungry for God once again. So it brings us to the level we all need to be. It's a swimmer. And so Ezekiel's noting all this. And now from the ankles to the knees to the waist, and all of a sudden he looks up and there's this incredible raging river that cannot be contained. And there's a flow. There is a power. There is pressure. It's moving. It's taking everything out that's in its path. He said the only way you could survive the depth of that water, the only way that you could survive the depth of that river is you better start swimming. You say, well, I never learned how to swim. Well, today you are. We're going to bring you to the edge, and we're going to do what many dads have done for many years. And while you're flying through the air, you say, I don't know how to swim. You pop up, swim, and all of a sudden those little, those little hands start doing the doggy paw. Your little paddle, your little feet start kicking. You start swimming. You start getting, and the smile. I've, I've seen our grandkids. I can't swim, Papa. I can't swim. I said, Yeah, you can. We're going to teach you. And we show them all the things to do: how to breathe, how to, how to kick, how to move your arms. Now I can't do, it, Papa. I said, Okay, yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden we we tip that little rap over. We love them. We're right there. We're not going to let nothing happen to them. But your father loves you too much not to throw you in. But he also loves you too much not to let you drown. He wants to see you swim. And there, he said, there was such a depth. There was something that was so important and that as we swim, he said, my feet could not touch the ground. I got out of the safe zone. Church, you need to hear me tell you today in all love and all, in all sincerity and humility, it is time that we stop playing it safe. Swimmers move past how they feel and worship and worship anyway. I've, I've seen it. I've been a student of worship and worshipers all my life. Some people, they'll come in on Sunday, and it is all on. I mean, it's whoo, hallelujah, hallelujah. And the next week, you couldn't get them to burp something, amen, praise God, if you tried. Why? Because they've made worship circumstantial. It's not mood. It's not how you feel. But God is God, and if you've got breath, you ought to praise him all the time. He is worthy of praise. Whether life has worked out for you, whether you've got everything the way you want it to or not, it's praise is not about how you feel. Praise is not about your emotions. Praise is about how God deserves it. Swimmers swim past how they look to others. And they take a stand for righteousness. Swimmers don't worry if they're popular or not. Come on, somebody. Listen, you and I got to make this agreement. If somebody doesn't like your pastor, it's none of my business. Because you don't care. No, I do care. That's why it bothers me. And you haven't done it for a long time, and we've gone past that. But I just think it's pretty immature to go up to somebody and say, hey, I just want you to know, I was talking to Bob the other day, and he really don't like me. 
What are you supposed to do with that? Just let it, listen, you hear something bad about somebody, you need to shut it off, and you need to say, I'm swimming. I ain't got time for all that. I'm going deep. If I stop swimming to deal with you, I'm going down to the bottom. Here we go. Leave them in, there in your wake. Come on. I said this to the, the leadership team a moment ago. I said, people come at the church. They come at our church, those churches, every church. And newsflash, people who go to church aren't perfect. I've invited people to church and say, I ain't a pastor, I'd love to come to your church, but I, I've spent jail time. I've been to jail before. I said, well, you fit in really good in our church. We got some ex-cons, ain't even funny. Pastor Josh told me a guy was climbing over a prison wall the, the other day, and he was not a tall statue. He said what it was was a little condescending. That's why I can't go. I used to behave like a, like a knucklehead. That's fine. We got a whole section full of knuckleheads. I'm not going to tell you which one it is this morning, but you're in it probably. Listen, we, we, have, we have this idea, this mistaken notion that we got to please everybody. If Jesus didn't please everybody, Jesus didn't win them all. And we got to keep swimming. We haven't got time. Come on, praise team. We haven't got time to stop. It's not treading water. It is about going deeper. We're not concerned how we look to others. Here's what swimmers are. They are survivors. They're not treading just to stay in the float. They are swimming in pursuit of God to change our world. Swimmers experience the fullness of God. I'm ready to go deep. If that is you, would you jump to your feet and give the Lord a mighty shout of praise, one of which he deserves. Oh, you didn't hear me. Let's give the Lord a mighty shout of praise. If you would remain standing for a moment, I'm just telling you, it's time to leave the kiddie pool for the kiddies. How you know when you're growing, well, some things change. You make some adjustments. I, I struggle with lust all my life, but I've stopped lusting. Then you made an adjustment. You're growing. I struggle with temptation all my life, but I've stopped getting that. I, I'm, not, I'm not in that world anymore. Well, then you're growing. I was cheap all my life. Now I'm generous. Well, you're growing. You're going deeper. I said I was cheap all my life. Listen, this church loves you, but we're not a cheap church. You are standing with some of the most generous people in the world, and it's time you join rank. Could I get a better amen? I've been small-minded all my life. I don't have a vision. Well, when you start getting a vision, trusting God and jumping in and start swimming, then you're growing. You're going deeper. It's church, it's time to go deeper, 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 deeper. It's time to go deeper. You are going to be really impressed with me. Kenny, would you hold the kitty pool for a moment? Just hold it. Uh, no. You're going to be so impressed with me. I remember a song. I, I looked up the lyrics myself without any administrative assistance. I, I typed the lyrics, got the lyrics to print out myself. <laughs> I'm growing. I'm going deeper. I can actually find the B on the keyboard now. I mean, it all, B always eludes me. 
I mean, when my hunting and pecking, and I thought, where did the bee go? It was there yesterday. Has anybody had troubles finding the bee? It's, it's hard to find a bee. I don't know what it is about. But I'm growing. I'm going deeper. I'm not going to be no geeky nerd like some of you. I mean, I've got no desire to, for all that. But So I found this song by Stephen Curtis Chapman. Interesting enough, it's called Dive. The long-awaited rains have fallen hard upon the thirsty ground and carved their way to where the wild and rushing river can be found. And like the rain, I've been carried here to where the water flows. Yeah, my heart is racing and my knees are weak as I step to the edge. I know there's no turning back once my feet have left the ledge. Once you jump, you're going in. Try that one time. This is not experience necessarily talking, but you'll bang your head on the diving board. Get up there and jump and decide, I don't want to do this. Try turning around and kapomp. You won't do it again. I know there's no turning back once my feet have left the ledge. And in the rush, I hear a voice that's telling me it's time to take a leap of faith. So here I go. I'm diving in. I'm going deep. In over my head, I want to be. Caught in the rush, tossed in the flow. In over my head, I want to go. The river's deep. The river's wide. The river's water is alive. So sink or swim, I'm diving in. People give the Apostle Peter such a hard time. John, Steve, because he walked out on the water to Jesus and then he saw the waves and he got panicky and he scared and he started to drown. Jesus rescued him. Jesus brought him to the boat, put him in. And they just give him all a hard time. And those 11 other disciples on that boat, I told you, I just told you, there you go again, big mouth. Look at you. Look at you, Simon Peter. You are all wet. And then he looked at the 11 and said, yeah, but you're all dry. Listen, church. It's time to go deep. It's time to dive in. Go deeper than the ankles and knees and the waist. And let's go deep. Are you hearing me in this house? If you've been glad you're here, give the Lord a great shout of praise. Hallelujah. Come on now. Here's what we're going to do. I want you to close your eyes just for a moment. I just want you and me to have a moment of talk. If you're still struggling with the same sin, it's because you lack depth. If you're still fighting the same battles, you lack depth. If you still can't make yourself pray and read the Word and be faithful, it's because you lack depth. And listen, there's no crime in that. The crime is if you remain content in the shallow end. Today's Word is to get you so excited about what's fresh and what's waiting on you when you go deep. People who bear fruit are the people who go deep. There's something exciting about going. You cannot get a swimmer to be content in the kiddie pool ever again. Once you're out there swimming and you feel the freedom of going for it, you won't like being up to your knees anymore. Uh-uh. So how many can honestly say, Pastor, I really, really know this word was for me today. Would you raise your hand across this church? I really know this word was for me today. All of you that are raising your hand, I want you to be the first to come to the altar. Coming out quickly. We're all going to come, but I want you to come first.
So proud of all of you. So proud of you. You didn't care what anybody thought. Why would we? You're in a place that loves you. You're in a place that loves you. Here's a question all you can only answer for you. What must you do to go deeper? God is calling you. Come out. I won't let you drown. There's more of me. Come. And today, when you stepped out of your seat, you broke off hesitation, you jumped off the ledge, and there's no turning back. What has been going on in you that God is saying in order for you to go deeper, you you need to deal with that. And it won't be the first time he's talked to you about it. It's a reoccurring thing. Isn't it interesting when you're not deep in God, every time you want to pray for somebody, he'll say, let's talk about that today. I I I didn't come to pray and talk about me. No, 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 no. It's exactly who he wants to talk to. You bring your need, and he wants to talk about your seed. You bring your problems, he wants to talk about your obedience. Could you all step forward to the altar? There's a song that's been in my spirit for many years, a couple years now. It's about just nothing else will do but you, Lord. Here's what we're going to do. I want you to have come to look up here, and I want to prophesy. Something broke. Something gave way. There was a release the second you came to this altar. You may not understand it. You may not feel it. You may not comprehend it right now. But God saw. It's like going to the diving board and you're bouncing thinking, can I do this? I'm worried. Well, what if, what if, what if? And then all of a sudden something rises up in you and you kick off and you go. Come on. You don't go deep by contemplating it, by thinking about it. You only go deep by going. Are there others? I want to wait on you. Are there others? Say, I'm under conviction today, Pastor. I need to get deeper. I need to go deeper. Okay. We love you. We care about you. We believe in you. They're still coming. God bless you. I'm tired of the shallow wind. Would all of you that come just lift up your hands and just receive God's grace. Receive his mercy and forgiveness. He's not going to scold you. He's not going to make you feel poorly. He's going to forgive you, and he's going to swim with you. Hey, leave the kiddie pool behind for the last time. Yeah, hey, my God. Waters to swim in, waters to swim in. Lord, let this church be a swimming church. Let this church be a church that's in the deep. We're not hanging out in the shallow and kicking around any longer. We're going deep with you. Now, all of you that are in your seats, I want you to step out from where you're at and begin to flood this front area. Come on, quickly. Yes. And we are going to move into a moment of sincere worship. We are going after God. I said we're 